Go ahead and take a seat. Kids these days will never understand what it was like. And I feel really old making that statement. But kids these days will never understand what it was like to sit in that desk, in that classroom, and stare up at the wall at that clock. Waiting for that bell, that sweet sound of freedom. That'll preach almost, won't it? That sweet sound of freedom. (laughs) But to sit in that classroom, looking at the clock, waiting for the bell to ring, knowing that the moment that bell rang, you were going to grab all of your stuff and book it home, get home as quickly as you could to watch the after school program. How many of you grew up with the after school program? We live in a Netflix society where you can watch the after school type programs any time of any day of the week. But when I was growing up, if you weren't home between 2.30 and 4 o'clock, you missed the after school program. Unless you had like a really rich family and you had a VCR that, but even then, never mind. But in my generation, I would run home, and my generation would run home to hear the iconic voice of Optimus Prime defending the weak. Or listen to G.I. Joe say, knowing is half the battle. And my generation, and me personally, those two cartoons and a handful of others, to a certain extent, shaped who I am today. Now, why am I telling you this? That's a weird introduction to a sermon. But those shaped me. And I'm telling you this because, how do I say that? Let me say it this way. Hi, I'm OC, and I'm a Closet Transformers fan. (laughs) I'll just call it out for what it is. And there's a little bit of me that's a little embarrassed and ashamed of that because let's be honest, it's a kid's show. I'm 41 years old. Why do I still love a kid's show from the mid-80s? I guarantee you, if a Transformers cartoon from the mid-80s came on the TV, I would stop whatever I was doing and watch that cartoon. I guarantee it. Because that, those cartoons were huge to me. But I'm a little embarrassed confessing that to you. Have you ever been embarrassed about something in your life? Every single one of us have something in our life that go, we we have at home and we go, you know, I I really love this and I would really love it if no one knew that I love this, right? Let me make a serious confession. There was a point in my life where I was ashamed of Jesus. There was a point in my life, I graduated high school I went to this university where I knew that I would be surrounded by fellow students who did not agree with my faith. And as a freshman in college, I struggled with that. That line between wanting to make friends and be popular, yet be a follower of Christ, I struggled in that area. I mean, I spent three years majoring in biology to disprove God because of that embarrassment and shame. And that's a whole different sermon. But there was a point in my life where I lived that way. But does God call us to be ashamed of the gospel? Absolutely not. Today, this weekend, we're starting a brand new series in the book of Romans. So I want you to take your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, uh, and I want you to turn to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, about every two to three chairs underneath them, there's a Bible, please grab one, open it up. We're gonna be looking through that chapter today. Um, If you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible with you. We would love for you to have a Bible at home. Now, Romans is in the New Testament, so the the second, you know, the the last one-third of the Bible, pretty much. Uh, Romans is, uh, you you go through the order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you hit Acts, and then Romans is the next book. If you get to 1 Corinthians, uh, pretty much any of of the Ians, the I-A-N books, INS, the Ephesians or Corinthians or Colossians, you've gone too far. Back up. 
if I've totally confused you, use the table of contents. That's why God gave us one. So, so Romans chapter one. Now, as you're turning there, let me explain a little bit about Romans. Let me, let me talk to you about Romans so that you kind of understand the background of the writer and why it was written. So Romans was written by a man named Paul. Uh, and Paul is pretty well known in the New Testament. He, we find him first in the book of Acts, uh, where a lot of his story is told. Paul was a Jewish leader whose job it was to go out, find Christians, and put them in jail or have them killed. That's what he did with his life. He pursued Christians to imprison them and kill them. And on one of his trips to go do this job, he has a miraculous, life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks to him, it changes his life, and he goes from someone who is hunting Christians to being a Christian himself. He places his faith in Jesus Christ and then goes on to write many books in the Bible. He goes on to take several journeys where he goes through the known world and spreads uh, the, the message of Jesus Christ uh, to, to different major cities throughout the known world. Um, he's arrested at one point or several points. Um, he, he's beaten. He, he suffers uh, because of this. Now, the book of Romans was written by Paul when he was in the city of Corinth. Uh, so the, the city that the letter of, letters of first, first and Second Corinthians was written to. He was in the city of Corinth, ministering in that city. And while he was there, he wrote the book of Romans. And, and one of the things that he says in Romans is, hey, I, I'm about to come visit you. And, and so here's some things to be thinking about. And there's one overarching theme to the entire book of Romans. The overarching theme, the, uh, the big idea in the book of Romans is Jesus Christ, why we need him, and what he did for us. And so more than probably any of the books of the New Testament, Romans spends almost its entirety just talking about why we desperately need Jesus and what he did to fulfill that need and how we can get our needs fulfilled, the, the spiritual needs we have, how Jesus can do those personally in our life. And so Paul lays out a long explanation of all of this. And that's what Romans is all about. The first few verses of chapter one actually give us kind of a little brief synopsis of the book. So look at your Bibles, your apps, whatever you're reading. Uh, look at Romans chapter one. We're gonna start in verse one. And it says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, stop there. First off, I want you to notice that was one sentence. There was not a period anywhere in there. You think I'm windy. Paul was windy. Man, can you imagine him giving this sermon? Did he take a breath where the commas just like, <gasps> okay, I gotta breathe here as I continue this ridiculously long sentence. But look at what it has to say here, especially verse one. I want you to catch one phrase. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, notice that phrase, the gospel. It, it, that's a church phrase, right? I mean, if, you, if you're at the mechanic shop talking about repairs needing to be done on your car, the words, the gospel, do not come up in that conversation. It's a Christian church Bible phrase, right? It, it is defined biblically. So what is the definition of the gospel? What does it mean? Well, the gospel is simply this. It's the good news of what Jesus did for us. 
When you see the statement, the phrase, the gospel, the person writing that phrase in the Bible means the message of the good news of what Jesus came and did for us. That's the gospel. So what exactly did Jesus do for us? You know, we just got done with Easter, uh, which is a celebration of the end of Jesus' life. So what did Jesus do? Well, let me start from the beginning. Let's back up just a moment. Every single person ever born on the face of the planet was born with a spiritual disease. We inherited it from parent to parent, all the way down, all the way back to Adam and Eve, they passed down to every person a spiritual disease. That spiritual disease is sin. We are all infected with it. We all suffer from it. And that sin has corrupted us. And ultimately, if we don't get the cure to that disease, to the sin that we're all born with, that disease will lead us to eternal suffering. There are forever consequences to this disease. And God, realizing that this disease knowing that this disease infects all of us, did something to fix the disease. He sent his one and only son, the son of God, to this earth to cure us of this disease, to be the cure. You see, God sent Jesus, his son, to this earth. He lived 33 years, and in that 33 years, he performed miracles, he healed people, he he taught about God and the things of God, And then at the end of his life, he was betrayed by one of his own followers. And he was given over to the authorities who performed an illegal trial, an overnight trial, which was illegal in that society. They performed an illegal trial to condemn him of things he did not commit. He was innocent because he was the son of God and lived a perfect, sinless life. And yet because of their desire to see him ended, they convicted him of crimes he did not commit. He was walked through the city in humility as people spit on him after being beaten almost to death and ultimately was led up to a hill where he was hung on a cross and died for our sins. And you say, how is that good news? How is the death of the Son of God. How is that good news to us? Because it's this. That spiritual disease that we are all plagued with needed a perfect sacrifice to be cured of. And Jesus, through his death, became the perfect sacrifice, the ultimate cure, the one and only cure for that spiritual disease of sin that we all suffer with. He became the cure for us. That's why it's good news. Because through his death, we don't have to suffer the consequences of the sin that we're all guilty of. But it doesn't end there. He died on that cross, and then three days later, he rose from the grave, defeating death, defeating sin. And then days later, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father in all authority. That is the gospel. That is the good message of what Jesus came to do for each and every one of us. This is what we mean. This is what Christians mean by the words, I'm saved. We are saved from the sin that we are all plagued with, that we are all guilty of. Jesus' death saved us from the eternity that that sin gives us. And instead of this eternal suffering, we have eternal perfection with God because of Jesus' sacrifice. And let me shift just a moment here. There are some of you in this room who have never stepped into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. This is new to you. Or maybe it's not new, but it's not something you've committed to yet. 
And if you're here and you've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can be saved of the sin that you're, you're born into, that you're guilty of, just like everyone is. All that Christ asks, all that Jesus asks, is that you believe in him, what he did for you, what he taught, and that you commit your life to him. That you allow a life-changing relationship with him to change your life and live your life accordingly. And if that's something that sparks your interest, if you have questions about that, if you wanna know more, or you wanna make that commitment this morning, all I'm gonna ask you to do is at the end of the service, come up here when everybody gets up and makes their way out and we're done and everybody's just smiling and leaving, come up here to the front and talk to one of the members of our prayer team. And they would love to answer any questions you may have about Jesus and explain to you what a life-changing relationship with Jesus looks like and what it means. So think about that and pray about that this morning. Now, that is the next step. But I want to look at a couple of other things this morning that we find in Romans chapter 1. So so open back up to Romans chapter 1. We ended in verse 6. I want you to fast forward to verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. You see, Christ connects us to courage. Christ connects us to courage. And where do I get that here? Look at 16. He says, For I'm not ashamed. That's a courageous statement. I am not ashamed. I am not embarrassed of the gospel. For it is the power of God. Christ connects us to courage. That courage, that connection is faith in Jesus. Trusting Jesus Christ with your life. You see, It's not enough to have a head knowledge, to to have an intellectual knowledge of Jesus. It's not enough for you or I to say, oh yeah, there was a guy who lived 2,000 years ago and he was a good guy and he taught us a lot of good things and he died on a cross. Okay, good deal. That's not enough because there's so much more than just a head knowledge and intellectual knowledge. That's part of it. You have to believe if you want Jesus to save you from your sin, you have to believe that intellectual side that he did exist, that he lived a perfect sinless life, that he was born of a virgin, that it was miraculous. That's part of belief. But, but the other side of belief that's necessary for us to be cured of that spiritual disease is to have a personal connection to Jesus himself. It's a relationship. It is following Jesus with your life. That's what it means to be saved. It's letting your life be changed because of the life you live with Jesus. And so that's what salvation means. It's living in such a way that others see Jesus in you. But Christ doesn't just connect us to courage. Christ also calls us to courage. Christ calls us to courage. Look at what this says. Again, verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The courage that he calls us to there is clear. You see, once we're connected to the courage, Jesus calls, to, calls us to live in that courage. And there are next steps that we need to take in our relationship with Jesus that's part of that calling of courage, of not being ashamed of the gospel, of living in the power of God through the gospel. And and so I want to give you four next steps that Christ calls us to live courageously when we begin a relationship with him. The first one is baptism. 
Uh, we already mentioned it last week. We or, yeah, last weekend we had the opportunity to baptize 25 people, and that's amazing. It's something that we celebrate. We love people getting baptized here at Calvary because if you go into the book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, you go to the last chapter chapter 28, Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, he gives a a commission, the great commission to his followers, to the people there. And he says to them, go through the ends of the earth, making disciples of all men and women and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus calls us courageously to get baptized once we become his follower. And baptism doesn't save us. And we explain this every time we do baptisms. Baptism does not save us. It is that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that saves us. What baptism is, is an outward statement to the world. This, This is who I was, and this is who I now am because I've been changed by Jesus. But it's not just a suggestion. It's a calling. When you begin a relationship with Jesus, he calls you to then go be baptized. And if you have not been baptized, if you're sitting here today and you go, you know what, I love Jesus with all my heart and my life has been changed by him, but I have not been baptized, we wanna make that easy for you. We wanna help you take that next step. All you have to do is let one of the pastors know, call the church office, we will make all of the arrangements for you. Because we want to help you take that next step in your relationship with Jesus. So the first calling of courage is baptism. The next step in that calling of courage is connecting to other believers. Connecting to other believers. And here's what I mean by that. In our American culture, there is a lie spreading around that says that you can love Jesus and not love his church. Or or you can go to a church like Calvary And let's be honest, you could walk in the doors of this church, you walked in the doors of this church today, and you could easily walk in and walk out without without ever connecting, right? But is that what Jesus calls us to do? Let me dispel that myth. The myth that you can love Jesus but not have to go to church. If you fast forward in the book of Romans to Romans chapter 12, or you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you're gonna find an argument there by Jesus that you are called to be connected into what he calls the body of Christ. And he makes it clear that if you're not connected to the body of Christ, you're not gonna thrive in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because think about the analogy that Jesus is using here. A body is interconnected, isn't it? If I was to take my finger off of my body, yuck, and and set it off to the side, is my finger apart from my body going to thrive? No. We spiritually cannot thrive. We were not designed to follow Christ in isolation. We're commanded to connect with the body of Christ, to, to live life with other believers growing with each other, encouraging each other, supporting each other in times of difficulty. And so it's not true that we can live our lives apart from the body of Christ. We as Christians, as followers of Christ, are called courageously to live our lives in the body of Christ, connected. Think about it. This past couple of weeks, Calvary had the opportunity because of you. This is not patting our church on the back. This is patting the congregation on the back. Because of your generosity, we were able to give out $7,500 to the needy in this community in the last two weeks alone. Because of your generosity. But let me ask you this. Can you do that apart from the church? Probably not. It's a body working together that changes like Havasu for Christ, is it not? And if you're not connected intimately with that body, you are disconnected and you cannot thrive 
in Christ disconnected from that body. The difference that we make for Christ is because we're a body. And so connect, whether that's connecting into a life group or a ministry or whatever that looks like, start living life connected to the body of Christ. It is not enough to come on the weekends and sit and be encouraged by the message and worship and then go home and make no other connection. It's not enough. And so find your connection point to the body of Christ. And I'm not saying necessarily that it has to be this body of Christ. I'm saying connect to a body of Christ and get involved. So, calling of courage, the next steps. Baptism, connecting to a body of Christ. Thirdly, it's connecting to others who don't know Christ. Think about the illustration that I've been using all morning. We are plagued, every person born on the face of this planet is plagued with a spiritual disease that will send every single one of us without a cure, will send us to eternal suffering, correct? But we, as the body of Christ, have the gospel. We have the cure, And we're not called to hoard that cure to ourselves and hold it to ourselves and not give it out to the rest of the world. We're called to go out and do that. Remember Matthew 28, the Great Commission? Go into all the world making disciples of all people. We're commissioned by Jesus himself to go and spread this cure. If you had a friend or a family member, a loved one or a coworker who was dying of a disease and you had the cure sitting in your medicine cabinet, you'd go get the medicine, wouldn't you? Yes, of course we would. We have the cure. We've got the cure for every person on the face of the planet. And as the body of Christ, we've gotta go share that cure we've got to go share jesus christ with those who are dying of their sin we have it and all it means is that we go and live our lives change the way we are in such a way that our lives scream the name of jesus to the people around us in a good way scream in a good way but so to the point that as we live our lives, the people around us look at us and go, I don't know what it is you have, but I desperately need it. And when that takes place in their mind and heart, you have the opportunity, I have the opportunity to then say, hey, why don't you come with me to church? Because that thing that I've got, that's where you can find it. And you don't have to present the amazing God. That's my job. That's Chad's job. That's Chet's job. We've got people here to answer those hard questions. All we ask you to do is bring people here. Take them to some church. It doesn't have to be Calvary. Take them to a body of Christ where they can be exposed to the cure that Jesus provides. It's not enough to accept that cure and then not give others the opportunity to accept it. So baptism, connect others to other believers, connect to others who don't know Jesus, and lastly, serve Jesus. It's not enough, again, I keep going back to this, it's not enough to come on the weekend and be lifted up by the worship and be encouraged by the message and then go home and not do anything. Because Christ, if you go back to Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, when it talks about the body of Christ, it says that we exist as the body of Christ to serve the church so that the gospel can be spread. If you invite your friend to Calvary and they've got little ones and you say, bring your whole family, but we don't have any volunteers over in that nursery area, in that children's area, we just failed that family. And there are so many opportunities for you to serve here at Calvary if you're looking for a place. We have children that need to be loved on. We have teenagers that need to be loved on. 
We've got women's ministry. Ladies, if you, if you want to invest in other women, come be a part of our, our great women's ministry. Men, if you want to invest in other men and do things with them that, that you can share Christ together while having fun together, come join us. We have a sportsman's ministry. We've got a four by four group that goes out in the desert for the name of Jesus. We have car clubs for the name of Jesus. We have a tech team that, that serves in the back every single service. If you love technology and computers and that stuff, go talk to David, our tech director. We have so many opportunities to serve. There's so many opportunities to, for you to do what God designed you to do so others can know Jesus. It's not enough to come on the weekends and go home. You have to find a way to serve Jesus with the talents and the gifts and the knowledge that he's given you. You're called, I'm called, we're all called to live courageously, not ashamed, as Paul said. Not living like me in my Transformers obsession, but living unashamedly of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what is the next step that Christ is calling you to? Now, I talked about that Christ calls us to courage, but I'll be honest, I'm gonna go back to something I said earlier. I think the most difficult point of courage is that first step, is, is beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ for the very first time. So I'm gonna say it again, if you're here and you do not know Jesus, your life has not been changed by him because you have not stepped into a life-changing relationship with him, we wanna make that easy. So here's what's gonna happen. If you've got questions or you wanna commit your life to Jesus today, I'm about to pray. The worship team's gonna come up here, they're gonna sing one more song and then dismiss us. And at that dismissal, everybody's gonna get up and they're gonna walk towards the doors and get ready to leave. All you have to do is come in the midst of that chaos, come up here to the front and talk to one of our prayer team members. And they will walk you through, they will answer your questions. But don't walk out of here with questions or with doubts or knowing that you should make a commitment and you didn't do it. Have the courage that Christ is calling you to have and take that next step. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son.